Hi, welcome to Explore's live chat. We're live here in the heart of the Johnson Strait at Craycroft Point. My name's Megan and I'm the videographer for Orca Lab. This is now my fifth summer on the coast of British Columbia and it's my third here with uh, Orca Lab. Um, I'm going to be here for the next hour to answer any of your questions about the area and about the orcas and the lives of these whales and um, anything that I can answer I'll, I'll do so. I don't come from a science background so some of the questions I might have to do a very quick pass on but um, most of them I should be able to answer so we'll start with the first one. So the first question is are there many new babies this season and if so how many? Um, that, I, that I know of, we've had at least three different new babies that I've seen uh, of the family groups in this area. I think my favourite is really I-27's new baby, which won't yet have an ID number. Um, we had a report that there was a very new baby in the I-15's group as they were coming into the area, and that provided a lot of excitement for us. Um, and I was actually lucky enough to see uh, the baby up close, which was really, really, really great. Um, probably less than six months old because it still was very very not only very tiny but it was very uh, had a, the white parts of the of the whale had a tinge of orange to it which usually indicates that they're less than a year old so that was really really neat to see that both doing really well and we've seen them four or five times this summer which has been really good uh, the second question is is the northern resident orca population stable and have there been an increase in numbers um, as far as I know that the population is on a, a very slow increase consistently especially in the last two or three ID catalogues that have been brought out the population status indicates that it's on a, a very slight increase every year um, a really upsetting disappearance this year with A38 which is who is actually my favorite whale his name's Blackney He's a member of the A30 Matri line, which is a family that spend a large amount of time in this area. And um, it's a family that I've grown to know over the past five years, and it's a family that's been through a lot in the last five years. Since I've known them, the, the visual lineup of the A30s has changed dramatically. Um, and uh, this year was, was a, a really upsetting when we heard a report that A38 was not seen with the A30s. So there have been some whales that have been seen missing but it's always always nice to know that the population is generally on the uprise which is really good. Uh, question number three is what are the main threats to these orcas? Um, one of the most wonderful things I think about working in this area is how wild this place is and how remote this place is and that is one of the reasons why I love it so much but there are times when it doesn't feel so remote and it doesn't feel like we're in the middle of nowhere because there is a very large amount of boat traffic in this area especially around the whales in 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 the height of summertime and so I definitely think um, ocean noise for me is one of the most disturbing threats to these whales and it's unfortunate that in actual fact disturbance can't really be measured on a scientific level at the moment so we don't really know how much damage the underwater sound is doing to the orcas but it certainly when we're sitting back at the lab with the headphones on and we're listening to boat noise 24 hours a day it's it's quite upsetting to think that that's what the whales have to deal with going on in their acoustic environment they're having to use so much more energy to produce louder sounds in order to communicate with their family and in order to find food as well so I think one of the largest threats to um, all whales and dolphins across the world is, is actually underwater sound um, another a big threat I think for the whales is their lack of food um, these whales that, that we study here, primarily the northern resident orca population, feed on salmon. And um, there isn't a lot of salmon. This year I've noticed that the Alaskan salmon boat fisheries have all been coming back through the area heading south a lot earlier than I've seen in previous years. And that's a really, really alarming thing um, to witness. And uh, with 
deforestation and the damming of a lot of rivers, the, the populations of wild salmon are uh, decreasing at a, a very scary level and that's, um, that's worrying for the whales because their primary food sources is very slowly being taken away from them. And it's not just to do with deforestation and the damming of rivers, overfishing is, is a very a large um, impact and also salmon farms is a huge impact. The uh, Norwegian salmon farm viruses that are being now found in the wild salmon here in British Columbia is, is very very worrying and the world population is under increased threat by these viruses so that's um, also a, a, very, a very heavy threat to these whales. Um, global warming is another one, plastic in the ocean is another one and uh, many many the ocean uh, temperatures rising is another one as well so the as much as this feels right now like we're in the middle of nowhere and it's an incredibly wild environment where the population of these whales is increasing that all seems like such fantastic news but they as well which is quite worrying um, so another question How many orca whales live in this area? So I think at the beginning of the season, the northern resident orca population was at around 292 whales, I think. That number will have changed ever so slightly by the end of this season with some disappearances and some births as well. So um, coming up to nearly 300 whales, but in terms of how many are actually using this area in particular, um, at the moment, I think we have nearly somewhere between 40, 30 and 40 whales using the area and they're actually just up to the north foraging in Blackfish Sound right now. Um, but I think the largest number of northern resident orca that I've ever witnessed in this area at the same time is, is near on 100 whales back last year around July time and that we have a number of families that regularly use this area in the, um, in the summertime and the A30s and a lot of the A5 pod and the I15s we've seen a lot of this year and that's been really really exciting so I'd say on a on a daily uh, time here in the summer maybe somewhere between 20 to 50 uh, whales at a time but that's not taking the humpbacks into consideration we have a huge humpback population here now in the Johnson Strait there's actually Ripple the humpback is just behind me over here um, and we've here at CP we've managed to ID I think it's 21 different humpbacks that have used this particular area and um, in order to work out who who it is that we're looking at we take pictures and we take video and then we review the images and the footage later on and we try and compare it with the catalogues that we have the northern resident orca population catalogue that's provided by the DFO and we also have a wonderful humpback catalogue that's provided by the Marine Education and Research Society that do some wonderful work in providing information on the population status of the humpback growth here which is really wonderful so I'd say at any given time there's two or three humpbacks hanging around out behind me here which is also really really cool um, where do the orca go in the winter and the spring months I don't know. No one knows, unfortunately. <laughs> but it's just nice to know that if no one's seeing them throughout the winter and spring months, then at least we know that they're uh, um, not not around tons of boats and, and stuff like that. So at least they get some time off. They're on vacation, I suppose. How much is left of the orca viewing season? Uh, well, I'm going to be here at Craycroft Point for uh, um, maybe four or five more days. And then we'll, we'll, we'll pack up Craycroft Point and I'll spend some time back at the main lab as well. And I go home on October the 3rd. And uh, for the northern resident orca, should should still continue past the time that I leave, hopefully, and uh, away into sort of October time. Um, but throughout the year, the transient orcas are seen in the area, the big whales and um, the humpbacks tend to um, head out around December time and they come back around May time. Uh, the northern resident orca population usually tend to come in sometime around the beginning to mid-July, so um, which is around the time that I should return here as well, just in time for their arrival. So yeah, they take some time off. Um, is there a time of year that the transient whales visit Vancouver Islands? 
If they're here intermittently, how do we recognise them? If not, where are they normally seen? So the, the, the big killer whales, the transient killer whales, these are the whales that uh, prey on marine mammals such as dolphins, sea lions, seals and porpoises. Um, it's uh, quite a large population of whales, but it actually has an incredibly huge area that they cover all the way from the south end of California in the USA right the way up to the northern tip of Alaska here so it's a, it's a very large range for them and the big orcas are seen year round here um, Orca Lab has audio recordings and visual sightings of every month of the year for these um, these whales and so it's hard to pinpoint exactly where you'd be able to see them at what time of year but the inside passage here between uh, Victoria and the north end of Vancouver Island is uh, definitely a good spot throughout the year to have a good chance of seeing those whales. When spotting the whale, it says, when spotting the whales, are you able to tell who they are by their dorsal fin itself, or is it the saddle patch behind the dorsal fin? That's a really great question. It's actually a combination of the both. Um, we're lucky here at Orca Lab. going on under the water so when we hear the calls of the orcas we can actually identify which family groups it is that we're listening to I'm not very good at it but there's a couple of people back at the lab that are incredibly good ear for it and um, so sometimes we can even actually narrow it down to a group of seven to ten whales that we know we're listening to before we've even seen them so that narrows it down uh, wonderfully for us um, and then when it comes to actually um, identifying the individual whales it is not only the dorsal fin but the saddle patch that gives us a really good idea as to who we're looking at um, different scars and shapes of saddle patches and then sometimes the dorsal fins have small notches and nicks taken out of them either from um, accidents or bumps and scrapes things like that and so that gives us a really good indication as to who we're looking at as well uh, question number nine is when and how do orcas sleep? They can actually put one side of their brain to sleep at any time. So they actually, they'll either, the whales will always have one side of their brain awake and conscious at all times. So often what we do see is we see resting lines here, which is when the whales all group up into a big line, they get close in together and they travel very, very slowly and they almost breathe simultaneously together and that's called a resting line and that usually means that the whales are taking some some time off and kind of recharging the other half of their brain but they certainly don't um, fully go to sleep no number 10 have you ever had to help with an orca rescue or if one was beached I haven't personally thank goodness had to um, participate in the rescue of of an orca at all but um, a really interesting story which happened over 10 years ago now was a really young whale called Springer who is a member of the Northern Resident Community, A73, and she was found alone at the age of around two down in Seattle. She was very sick, very hungry, and um, she was without any other whales. And uh, they sent some audio recordings up to Orca Lab and they figured out that it was A73 and unfortunately her mother had passed away over the winter. So they created a, a net pen for her. They got her strength back up, they gave her antibiotics to uh, regain her health and they made sure that she had as little human contact as possible. She was fed live fish for a tube at a different part of the net every day and um, eventually they, she had enough strength and she was well enough that they brought her back up here to her um, home and they kept her in another pen in a place called Dong Chong Bay which is just around the corner here. And actually the next day her close family group came through the area and started they started vocalizing together and they let the net down and and off she went and she slowly integrated herself back into the social society of, of her family and uh, two years ago she brought back um, a calf with her and we've seen the baby this year her a101 I think her name, and her name's spirit and so the fact that just over 10 years ago she was all on her own and her prospects weren't looking too good she's not only fully integrated back into the social society but she's produced offspring as well so that's best possible outcome it doesn't always um, end up as it doesn't always end up as as good as that but that was a really good news story that one um, question 
Number 11, when is the best time to wa watch the or orca migrations? Uh, right now. <laughs> Any time from the beginning of July right the way through till till right now, we have, I wouldn't necessarily call it a migration, this is their summer habitat, so they use this habitat not only for social reasons, but for the salmon, and also for the rubbing beaches as well. Time from mid-July up until now. Number 12, how cold is it up there? It's quite chilly. It's nice when the sun comes out, and in August we had a couple of 20 centigrade days which was really nice. The water is insanely cold, you can't get in the water for any more than a couple of seconds. Um, when we dive to put in the underwater camera here at CP we're wearing dry suits at the time and, and scuba gear so it's not, it doesn't feel that cold then but um, it, the water is insanely cold. Yeah. Hi Megan, my seventh graders would like to know how many orcas you've seen in your lifetime as a videographer. Oh my goodness, I have no idea. Um, I'd probably estimate it at around 150, hopefully. That sounds like a pretty good number to me, but that makes me feel incredibly lucky to think of that number. But yeah, probably, orca's probably about 150 and probably about the same with, uh, the same with humpbacks as well. And that's just probably in this, in this area. I haven't seen that many whales and dolphins in, in other countries around the world, apart from Iceland and uh, the Azores, but in this area here, certainly. Enough for anyone's lifetime, that's for sure. <laughs> Number 14, have you seen any changes in their traveling migration patterns due to human-made problems? Uh, my time here on the coast has only spanned about five years, so the changes that I would have seen have probably been very, very minimal. I've seen very, very busy seasons and I've seen not so busy seasons. So there's definitely, couldn't say that there's a pattern occurring there, but I definitely think over the course of the time that Orca Lab has been operating in this area, there's most certainly been a large number of changes in not only the number of orcas that are using this area, but how frequently they're using this area. And I think that very much stems back to the anymore and so I think the whales are using this area less uh, because of it. Um, another question is, have you seen any shark and orca interactions in this area? No, because we don't have sharks here. <laughs> uh, number 16, what can we do to help keep the whales safe? This is a really great question, one that I could probably talk about for hours and hours on end. Um, and it was a question that came up last year that I tried to answer as well and I should have written down some ideas for this time, but one of the biggest things that I would say that every single person in the world could definitely do to help is avoid single-use plastics at all costs. Try and do bulk buy shopping and yeah, try and use uh, reusable shopping bags and recycle as much as you can but really try and buy as, as little single-use plastics as you as you physically can. Um, a second one would be to conserve your energy as much as possible. Um, turn off appliances whenever you can. Try and use as little lighting as possible. Look into switching onto renewable energy such as solar and wind and hydro which is always a, a wonderful thing to do. Um, and just to really be more conscious of uh, using more public transport, try using your car a lot less, uh, look into upgrading into hybrid energy car systems. Um, and another huge thing that I think globally is making a huge difference around the world is the um, is the idea of eating less meat and dairy products and um, I think that's the animal agriculture is um, a huge huge contributor to global warming and I think uh, cutting as much meat and dairy out of your diet as possible is, is definitely something that will um, make a really really good impact on this planet. Um, I could probably think of another hundred things but I can't think of any more right now. Um, another question here is, any surprising species in the area this year? That's a really great question. We had a grey whale 
here in I think it was the end of July which was really really exciting the grey whales usually spend over here you can see Vancouver Island this landmass here grey whales spend their time on the other side of that island on the west coast um, right out on the outskirts of the Pacific and they do they have a migration from Baja in Mexico right the way up to um, Alaska um, just a little bit before this time they come through around start around May time and and it ends around now and we had um, one grey whale come on the inside of Vancouver Island which is quite unheard of and that was really exciting uh, to see that um, another one here is is there a way people can volunteer during the summer and if so what is the process um, we do have volunteers here every summer it's usually quite a small team of uh, really really dedicated people a lot of the people that come here are actually people that come back every year um, to, to volunteer their time and I've got to know some incredible people over the time that I've I've spent here you don't necessarily have to have a science background to get involved I don't have a science background and uh, it's usually uh, passion and dedication to to the project that, that will get you on on board as long as you're willing to work in a team and you're um, interested in really understanding the bigger picture that we're trying to put together here. We don't go out on boats and do boat based research so um, all of our research is done from land. Orca Lab's ethos is to try and learn as much as possible about these whales without interfering with their lives in any way. So. Um, I stay on land for the entire three and a half months that I'm here and so um, any of the interactions that I film from these cameras are purely because the whales have come close to me not because I've gone close to the whales so it does usually mean that you spend quite a lot of time waiting and um, that's something that gives me great lessons in patience and optimism and but it's when you when the whales finally do come really really close to you and you get that wonderful footage it's possibly the most satisfying thing in the world it's wonderful number 19 if salmon supply was short would the whales eat seals possibly do you ever come into contact do they ever come into contact and if so what happens the northern resident orca population have never been known to um, attack um, another marine mammal and I think one of the wonderful things about this population of whales is they're incredibly habitual animals. They've been doing the same things for hundreds and hundreds of years, we think, especially in the time that Orca Lab's been operating here. Um, they, whales will only speak the dialect that their mothers spoke. They'll only socialize with the whales that their mothers socialized with. They'll only eat the salmon that their mothers ate, and they'll only do the things that their mothers did. And so they're incredibly habitual whales and so I very highly doubt that they would change their food source um, unless, unless it became a very very desperate desperate measure but I don't think in my lifetime that will happen fingers crossed they won't have to resort to that uh, another question here is does anyone ever go out on rowboats and ever make contact with the orcas um, there's quite a lot of kayak groups in the area um, and I think they come into contact with the orcas uh, very often. Um, they have different camps based around the area and they move from one camp to, to the next every, um, every day, but I've personally not been out in a rowboat and tried to make contact with them, no. 21. Have you, ever, have you seen Holly lately? Yes, we did. Holly, not this month in September, but in August um, and July we saw a lot of Holly. Holly is A42. Yeah, and she is a member of the A42 Matra line. And um, yes, I think most most days during August we saw her family and she's doing wonderfully. And the A, the A5, A5 pod are one of my favorite families around here. And the 42s and the 23s and 25s spent a lot of time here this summer and it was uh, really, really great to see them all together. Could the Biggs orcas be any threat to the resident orcas? That's a really good question and it's something that I've witnessed only a couple of times in my time here but if anything they avoid each other I think. Um, a prime example about a week ago we had a group of um, big orcas coming down the Vancouver Island side here and we had a group of resident orcas traveling in the opposite direction up the Hanson Island shoreline just behind me here and um, at one point they were both vocalizing in the same uh, 
in the same vocal space for a very short period of time and they actually avoided each other entirely and the resident orca changed direction in order for the bigs to actually then travel up into Blackney Pass so that was really interesting and I think for the most part the interactions that have always been seen have been that of avoidance and not um, definitely there's never been any form of aggression between them that I know of. Hi Megan is there someone at Orca Lab all year round? Yes the hydrophones are listening 24 hours a day seven days a week 365 days a year. In the winter time when it's less uh, busy that Orca Lab now has winter caretakers that look after the um, lab over the winter months from October through to March and um, but there is someone on Hanson Island listening um, all year round which is an incredible feat. Number 24, why can't the northern residents be tracked or can we find out where they go? Is it simply due to the physical problems with tagging or is it expense of such a project or some other reason? I think it's probably a majority of all things but I think most importantly the tagging of whales is not only a very invasive procedure in, in putting the tag onto the whale but there's two different types of tags. You could fairly non-invasively tag a whale for around 48 hours with a suction cup um, and collect an incredible amount of data and eventually that would fall off and float to the surface and you could um, pick that up and that's something that's been um, done a lot all over the world but tagging for a lengthy period of time, maybe over six months, would actually involve having to physically attach the tag to the whale, which is not only an incredibly invasive procedure, but it's ended up in a lot of deaths of whales through uh, blood poisoning and um, them not taking well to the foreign object being attached to their body. So I think it's, it, it's I think, more a moral situation than a funding situation with that. It would be fantastic to find out um, more information about where they go um, through the winter but I think it's not really worth it. Uh, number 25 is, is Lulita a part of the family that's here? Um, Lulita is a whale that is housed at Miami Sea Aquarium and she's actually been there for around 45 years. Um, she's been on her own in that tank for a very 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 long time and it's actually the smallest orca tank in the world and it's incredibly sad. Um, but she's actually a member, member of the southern resident orca population, which is the distant cousins of this population up here. So she, her family, still to this day, um, spend time down on the southern end of Vancouver Island in the um, a waters off Victoria and the Puget Sound area in the USA as well. And so that's where her family is. But there's a similar um, case up here and that the A5 pod has a member of their family that doesn't spend time here and that's Corky and she actually lives in San Diego SeaWorld San Diego and she has lived in SeaWorld San Diego for 47 years now which is just such an incredible feat that she is still still alive we think she's around 50 years old now she was taken from this area when she was around two years old and still to this day the A42s that's part of Corky's pod and Fife her brother um, is still alive and He's one of my favourite whales and I've got some wonderful footage of him and his family and when I think about collectively the time that I've spent on this coast it's nearly a year and a half of my life and that year and a half collectively of my life has changed who I am entirely and the thought that Corky has been robbed of 47 of those years that she spent in the same tank is just absolutely heartbreaking and here at Orca Lab we really do feel that she could come home and be retired to this area we think that the best thing SeaWorld could ever do would be to give the go-ahead to allow Corky to come home and we could build her a sanctuary here where she could hear the natural sounds of the ocean and hear the sounds of her family and communicate with her family and learn to catch live fish again but the clock really is ticking Corky's 50 years old now and there's going to be a time very soon where SeaWorld will not have the opportunity to do the right thing so we definitely urge you to head over to um, there's various sites that do a lot of work on the Three Corky campaign Peter has a fantastic video that they've just released all about her campaign and it's really easy to get involved in just purely signing a petition or spreading the word that we really think she could come home and, and live out some of her best years of her life here with her family would be really really great as should Lolita as well there's some wonderful campaigns to try and bring Lita home to a sanctuary not far from where her family spend time so that's definitely worth looking into 
Number 26 is who are the I-15s? Cannot find them in the catalogue. Ah, that's interesting. So the last couple of years, what happens with the catalogues is as the families change, for example, Holly's family used to be referred to as the A8s, and they're now referred to as the A42s. And this sort of thing tends to generally happen when the matriarch of a family um, passes away. Not always instantaneously, but uh, sometime after that as the family begins to grow, or if one particular whale starts to have a certain number of offspring, the group will start to be referred to as a different um, as a different number and that's usually based on on the new matriarch of that family which is why Holly's family is now referred to as the A42s instead of the A8 so that's generally what's happened with the I15 matriline it's branched into a couple of different groups there's the I16s and there's also the I27s um, as well and so even if you can't see them in the catalog if you look down on the family tree lines you can actually see where they where they stemmed from and um, you can tell what the family used to be called up until a certain certain point so sometimes it becomes quite confusing when a new catalog comes out but we get used to it eventually but sometimes the families always get referred to as um, something different to the catalog just through habit I suppose as well Number 27, are you using drones to film the orcas? There is a couple of researchers in the area uh, working on behalf of the Vancouver Aquarium and NOAA Fisheries that are doing some wonderful drone studies in the area, giving us some great insight into um, whether whales are pregnant or not. So it gives us a really good idea in, um, into how many, uh, of how many babies we have imminently on their way. and. Um, I think over the course of a number of years they'll be able to te they'll be able to start doing some um, growth growth studies, which is going to be really really interesting. I have a drone here for filming as well, but in actual fact, filming from land and filming the whales is actually an incredibly tricky uh, feat. The range on the drone is 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 quite substantial, but um, you have to keep the drone in your visual line of sight at all times so anything uh, past 500 meters and I can't actually see the machine anymore so it usually I have to weigh up my options as to whether it's going to be a better idea for me to film on this big camera or whether to film on the drone so we haven't managed to get any great footage thus far yet but there's always next year 28 when diving in the water have you ever had any of the whales come up to the divers um, not for me when I've been diving. A couple of seals and some curious sea lions have come to take a little look, but um, nothing that big. I don't really know how I'd react if I saw a whale underwater. I think I'd be quite frightened and excited all at the same time, but no, it hasn't actually happened. Um, we tend to only do the dives when we know that there's not whales in the area or transiting the area just to um, eliminate the chances of, of that happening, but that's certainly doesn't mean that it could never happen. Uh, 29 is, do you think aquariums like SeaWorld are helpful or harmful to orcas as a species? I think based on the question I just answered before about Lulita and Corky, I think it definitely is quite obvious that we're not pro-captivity here. Um, I think places like SeaWorld and aquariums all around the world are in an incredibly um, strange position right now in that their stocks are falling and public opinion on whether they should or shouldn't be operating is, is very slowly changing and I think what they now have to do is make a decision as to try and shift their business model into something a little bit more positive and I think a couple of places are really taking a good step forward, steps forward into that and um, we just need them to take it a little bit a little bit further. Um, number 30 says greetings from the Netherlands. Hello. Uh, can you explain to me what that fishing boat with the drift nets was doing there a couple of times now? I thought it wasn't allowed because of a protected area. Yeah, that boat's called the Ocean Predator, and it's actually a First Nations boat that comes out and does test fishing. So it will come into the area. It was actually here this morning. Did a, um, It will cast a net out, and it will pull it in, and then it does an estimated count on the fish, and it actually gives us an idea of um, what the salmon runs are doing. Um, this year and how how large the salmon populations are so fear not they weren't actually catching fish they were just um, catching them in the net giving a, a sizable count and then releasing the net again so yeah number 31 I've noticed in the last week on the cams the boats seem to follow the whales everywhere could this be having an impact on their hunting 
Um, certainly, I think that, that could be the case. There, there are times when it, it feels very uncomfortable with the amount of boats that we're seeing uh, with the whales. We have, um, we have a, a very good community here um, in this area. We definitely have far less whale watchers than happens in the south end of Vancouver Island. A bunch of incredibly wonderful people that um, have been working in this area a very, very long time. And uh, we have very good guidelines that um, are enforced by uh, some wardens that we have here throughout the summer as to um, respectful distances to keep from the whales and how long we're viewing them for. And uh, the whales have protected areas that they're allowed into, that, that the boats are not allowed into. The Robson Bight just down to the east end of Johnson Strait here is, is a protected area that the boats aren't allowed in. So they do have some areas where they have um, a safe place to to be but yeah it can get quite uncomfortable with the number of boats in the area and especially when we're listening to the hydrophones as well in August it can get very frustrating when we're um, recording the beautiful sounds of these whales and you have horrid boat noise in there as well but it's whale watching does such a wonderful thing as well I think for um, the population of the world growing to love these animals and understanding how they can help them and protect them and I think that's also very important as well so it's a tough one how deep is the sea around here? Are there more detailed maps of the area so that we can follow when Orca Lab announces their present at some, presence at some point? That's really great. The, the, the deepest point here of the Johnson Strait is about 500 metres um, deep, but I think around here it, it has a lot of stages where it drops off um, um, off the coastline here. But um, certainly on Google Earth, um, there's some really, really detailed maps, but if you get a proper marine map, it gives you some really good estimates on the depth of all the areas here. And uh, that would be really good to have a um, some form of map available on Explore where we can really, they can understand where all the cameras are and what areas the cameras are um, looking at. So eventually what you, you as the audience will be able to do is actually be able to track the orcas as we do um, through the entire entirety of the, um, of the area. That would be really cool. What is the difference between the orca populations? So we have two, the two populations that spend time in the area. There's the big uh, orcas that eat marine mammals, and then there's the residents that eat the salmon. And um, not only acoustically are they completely separate, and not only um, are they separate in the, the, the source of prey that they eat, but um, they're actually genetically separate. This was sci a, a scientific paper that came out a couple of years ago that worked out that they're actually scientific they're actually genetically separated by nearly a hundred thousand years which is very very cool the the progress in understanding the ecotypes of orcas are um, wonderful uh, some really good stuff coming out on that now and we're understanding that not only are they separated genetically hugely but you can actually tell the difference just by looking at these whales as to how different they are the the big orcas here have very pointy dorsal fins whereas the residents have rounded ones so we can usually tell just by looking through binoculars as to what ones we're looking at um does the weather sometime does the weather have something to say about how often we see the orcas it seems like it's raining when we see them less uh definitely not the whales like the rain just as much as they like the sun so um, I think the, uh, the weather has nothing to do with how often we see the whales. How many orcas are left in the wild? I don't know the answer to that question. I think the last population status I heard of was around 250,000. Um, um, but they're definitely, orcas are the, um, the most widespread marine, mar widespread mammal on the planet second to humans. So they're found in every single ocean and, and most sea in the world, which is really, really great. Do the big orcas ever visit the rubbing beaches? Um, they, uh, the big orcas have never been known to actually rub on the rubbing beaches, but I'm sure they have passed through that area from time to time. Question 40 is, who's your favorite whale? My favorite whale um, was A38, unfortunately he passed away this year, but second favorite would definitely be Fife. He's an incredible whale. I, I think of everything, it's for me the reason I love him so much is what he stands for he stands for so much everything he does is free and based on his sister's life Corky in SeaWorld San Diego I, I think that everything that he stands for is everything that she doesn't have and I think that's for me that's such a compelling thought that he, he'll always have a really special place for me Five. 
Have you ever witnessed a humpback protecting marine mammals from transient orcas? I read an article about this quite recently that there's been a, a huge amount of video footage that's been collected of humpbacks seemingly protecting other um, marine mammals from the threat of uh, transient orcas and I've never witnessed it myself but I think it's a really um, interesting thought. It gives us quite an insight into the emotional lives of these animals and I think that's something that will be really interesting to learn more about. What is the lifespan of an orca? Um, we have, uh, there's been many, many studies done over the years. From what I know, that the, the lifespan of a female northern resident orca can be anything between sort of 40 to 80 years. I know that there's a, a southern resident orca down in the south end of Vancouver Island that's estimated to be 105 years old, and that's just absolutely incredible. The male lifespan tends to be a lot shorter than that, usually between sort of um, 25 to 50 years old, and so a lot less of that. But the what's incredible is actually the lifespan of an orca in captivity is actually 14.5 years, I think, was the last study that came out of that. So that just gives you a really incredible insight into um, the, li the difference of the lives from captive orcas to, to free ones. Have the northern residents ever come into contact with the southern residents? We actually do. Um, I've seen a picture before of the southern residents and the northern residents in the same shot, which is just incredible. The southern residents usually tend to transit through this area at least once a year. Um, it doesn't often coincide with the northern residents being here as well, but I think it's um, very similar to the interactions between the, the big orcas and the, tran and the northern residents. They don't communicate with each other, and in if anything, they would avoid each other. Um, do you have any favourite encounters or sightings of orcas? Um, Every day here is completely different and every day here brings an encounter with some animal that makes me feel abundantly lucky to be here. Um, just yesterday Ripple the humpback surfaced just underneath the deck here at high tide, must have been maybe three or four metres off the deck and it was just incredible. I managed to get a really nice photograph of her nostril which was something that I've never got before and it, it, it's in, incredible. I think probably one of my favourite encounters is um, with the A5 group with Corky's family and, and Holly's family as well and that was a still day very much like today and they all surfaced right out here in a huge big resting line all I think there was 12 whales in total and they were coming up simultaneously together and it's it's not only the most incredible memory but I the video footage that we have of it is is also pretty stunning and it's yeah something that I will never ever forget. Um, hi Megan, why did you start studying orcas? Um, Free Willy. <laughs> when I was four years old I watched the film Free Willy and that's when my obsession began and up until about the age of 11 I really wanted to be a trainer at SeaWorld. I wanted to be a SeaWorld trainer and when I was about 12 years old I brought a second-hand book called Orca the Whale Called Killer which was a book written by Eric Hoyt about this area and the work that was being done here in the 1970s and 80s and I fell in love with wild whales and I fell in love with this area and that was it. I uh, was obsessed with them ever since. I went to university and once I left university I tried to get out here as soon as possible to kind of start my life with these whales and we're now five years, five years in and I I can't believe that I'm actually here being able to do this. It's incredible. I'm insanely lucky. Um, why protect to save the whales? Why not? These whales are such a vital part of the ecosystem of this area, as are the salmon, as are the bears, as are the eagles, as are everything, and it would just be an in exponential loss to lose any part of this ecosystem, let alone um, the whales, they're incredibly important to a huge number of humans on this planet, not only the people working here, but people like you watching on Explore at home. You clearly love these whales as much as we do to be enjoying enjoying them and sending in your wonderful comments about the work that Explore does and the work that Orca Lab does. And I think that there's something about whales and dolphins and seeing whales and dolphins in the wild that um, really brings people together and I think it's something that will always bring people together so hopefully we'll never have to answer the question why we couldn't save them that's for sure. How can some countries like Japan continue to kill whales and dolphins despite international laws? That's a very interesting question one that I don't 
know a lot about other than I get very frustrated with the fact that it's still um, going on. There's a lot of direct action groups like Sea Shepherd that um, get involved down in Japan to try and help protect these whales and very effectively as well and I think slowly but surely you know legislation hopefully will be put in place that will uh, not allow them to continue to break the law but it is the number of whales taken every year um, not just in Japan but places like the Faroe Islands as well and Greenland is is incredibly disturbing and uh, it's also very very unhealthy for humans to be eating whale meat the whales and dolphins are at such a high part of the food chain that the levels of toxins and mercury in particular that are in the meat of these animals is insanely high far higher than any human should be ingesting so I think mercury poisoning is is going to be a a huge thing in Japan in, in years to come. How north do they swim? Do they reach the Arctic? I know that they, they do spend, the northern resident population spend also a lot of time in an area north of here called Kamano Sound, which is a couple of hundred miles north of here. But I'm not too sure about the northern residents spending time in Alaska. I don't know much about that. Have you seen dolphins interacting with the orcas and how common is it here? Every day this month we've seen Pacific white-sided dolphins spending time very, very close to the, the northern resident orca. I've got some lovely footage from last year, especially of um, orcas and Pacific white-sided dolphins spending time together. The dolphins do tend to harass the whales a little bit, especially the humpback whales get very irritated with the, uh, with the presence of the Pacific white-sided dolphins. And, um, but yeah, I don't think generally the relationship between the two species is that of a negative thing. I, I, I'd like to think that they enjoy each other's company in some ways. <laughs> Is it accurate to label an orca a killer whale? I don't particularly like the term killer whale. The term orca is not much different because the, the term orca is uh, loosely translated to uh, killer of the deep or demon of the underwater realm or something like that so that doesn't bring that much uh, connotation but killer whale is, is, is the name that they scientifically use um, these days but it's also a name that stems from many many years ago when the only sightings of these whales were seen offshore of them whale killers killing killing whales and I think it's to me brings a negative connotation to a species that is just such a peaceful and, and wonderful species that's so wholly centered around family life and social structure and I I think that the term killer whale is a little bit crass I like the word orca much more Megan please post your link to the website again I had it but I lost it the one with your incredible footage and videos yes of course um, we can get explore to to post um, a link to that uh, no problem it's a Vimeo page but what we're working on is trying to get some of the um, videos that I've put together embedded on Orca Lab's website as well over the winter would be really good so that people can access them a lot more so hopefully in the future you'll have a lot you'll have lots of easy ways to access all the footage that I've taken but in the meantime my Vimeo page I'll make sure that it's posted on um, Orca Live and on the Explore website so that everyone can can watch as many as they want <laughs> um, do the orcas mate for life? Interesting, with the, with the northern resident orcas, the, the, the study that has been produced over the last 10 years as to the, um, the DNA of the whales actually has indicated that the, the whales actually mate outside of their acoustical clan. So the, the northern resident population is split into three different clans. You've got the A's, the G's and the R's, and they don't share any call sets whatsoever. So it seems that the, um, the mating is... Um, decided by only mating with a whale that, that doesn't share any of the same calls um, that you do. So they don't mate for life. The fathers of the whales spend their entire lives with their own mothers. Uh, whales spend their entire lives with their mothers and only go off very briefly to, to mate. So the, the fathers actually have very little to do with the upbringing. They have nothing at all to do with the upbringing of the, of the babies. But the brothers and the uncles they certainly have a large role to play in the upbringing of babies within the group. A lot of babysitting is, um, is behaviour has been seen, and that's really, really neat. Yeah. Um, how long can an orca hold their breath? I think a lot longer than they actually choose to do so, but like us, they do have to come up um, and breathe. And usually we see them, depending on their behaviour at the time, but 
usually we see them do somewhere between nine and eleven um, short dives followed by um, a long dive that might mean they're down for anywhere between sort of three to eleven minutes but I'm pretty sure they can hold their breath for a lot longer than that. Uh, while on an orca whale watch in the Anne Quarters, Washington, we saw two pods meeting. The naturalist on board said the sighting was rare. They lined up facing one, one another and stayed like that for a while. What was happening? Um, I'm not too sure about the populations in that area and, and what ecotypes they are and, and how often that's been done, but it's certainly an, not something that's been seen of close proximity um, here. We have, two, we have lots of family groups that, that, that do come within close proximity with each other and display similar kind of behaviours, but um, usually just within the northern residents. Has there been any records of orcas being stranded in Vancouver? Actually, very sadly, yesterday, um, a transient whale, T... I think it's... Oh, I've forgotten the exact idea of the whale now, but um, a, an adult male orca was found just on the west side of Vancouver Island, a place called Banfield, further south from here. Um, the ter the He was seen um, looking very healthy just late August, so a couple of weeks ago. Um, and unfortunately he's been found washed up on the beach so the, um, the death has not been concluded yet so we don't, we don't know what happened to him but yeah, that's always very sad when that happens it's not very often that they actually find the body of the whale so hopefully what that means is that we can find out how he died and um, use the body for science and, and hope that we can get some really great answers fr fr from it um, and it says here, when do the calves mature into adults? Um, sexual maturity is usually reached somewhere between 12 and 14 years of age. Um, and around that same time, that's when we tend to start seeing a big change in the males. When um, We don't necessarily know whether a, a, an orca is a male or a female until they get to around this age and they start doing what's called sprouting, which is where their dorsal fin starts to become elongated and extended and eventually will end up um, turning into an adult male and the, the dorsal fin can nearly reach almost six foot in length. So once they get to around 14, 15 years old, they start to sprout and um, that's usually really exciting that we find out. Usually the whale will either have a calf or it will start sprouting and that's when we really know whether they're male or female. But yeah. Um, I think this is the last question we have here, is question 60 and that's what would cause a group of orcas to beach themselves? I think in terms of mass strandings, um, I think I've only ever heard once of a news report of a mass stranding of orca whales, and I think mass stranding usually refers to a group of more than five animals at one time. Um, and I think the only, they're very, very socially bound whales, and so I think, and it's happened a lot with pilot whales, that if, if one of the whales is sick and beaches itself, then the rest will actually follow suit and beach themselves as well, which is incredibly sad. Pilot whales in particular, there's been seen strandings of up to 100 different whales at a time, so that's incredibly sad, but it's definitely nothing that, definitely something that I've never witnessed here, that's for sure. But yeah, that's a bit of not a nice thing to end on, on that one. But um, yeah, it's been really great to sit down and answer all of your wonderful questions. And um, hopefully there's been some things that I can answer, that I've answered well and given everyone uh, some good things to think about. It's Explore, has, the co collaboration between Explore and Orc Lab has been such a wonderful thing for me to be involved in and uh, the whole idea of being able to preserve this area and to watch from a non-invasive standpoint is something that Orca Lab's strived for for years and years and I think this has really just put the cherry on top for this project. It's been wonderful and I'm totally privileged to, to be a part of it. So um, yeah, that's been really, really wonderful and uh, yeah, well, hopefully we'll do some more live chats and I'll be back next year and um, we'll, we'll see how it goes then. But yeah, thanks very much for listening. <laughs>